Uh, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, as you all probably know by now, uh, the David Silva wrongful death case is now settled for $3.4 million. Uh, so you understand the breakdown. Uh, out of the $3.4 million, $3 million goes to our clients, which are David's four children, uh, his mother Mary, and his brother Christopher Silva. Uh, 220000 went to David's girlfriend Tara Garlick, and 180000 went to David's oldest child who lives up in Northern California. This case is now over, and this settlement uh, is a bittersweet end to a long journey to achieving justice. And I say that it's bittersweet because it's bitter in that David is not here with us, and he is not here today to be a father to his children, to be a brother, to be a son. But it's sweet because we know that the money that we've obtained in this case is going to go a long way to helping David's children secure a bright future so that they have a full ride to college, so that they have opportunities to succeed in life. And these are all things that David would want for them. Early on in this case, the Sheriff's Department, Donnie Youngblood, the DA's office, Lisa Green, all claimed that they did investigations in this case. So-called investigations, where they told you that these officers did nothing wrong. And what I can tell you today is that those were not real investigations. The real investigation that went on in this case was an investigation that went on over the last three years. And that investigation was an investigation conducted by the lawyers who came in and took depositions of every single officer and deputy who was involved in this, all of the high brass in the sheriff's department who were involved in making decisions all of the witnesses who were brave, who came forward, some of whom videotaped the incident, all of whom witnessed what happened. All of these people were deposed. Documents were exchanged. Videos were looked at. And the result of that investigation is in. <clears throat> Those deputies and the officers involved in that incident killed David Silva. And this settlement of $3.4 million is a reflection of that reality. I'm going to pass it on. Oh, we'll just go ahead and switch spots. Um, so Tom can say some things. My name is Thomas Seabaugh, S-E-A-B-A-U-G-H. I'm a civil rights attorney in Los Angeles, and I worked on this case. This settlement represents for the Kern County Sheriff's Department a richly deserved black eye. This case was more than about how they killed David Silva. It was also about how they tried to cover up what happened. I think it's useful to look back at what was said three years ago about how David Silva died. What was the official story? Kern County Sheriff Donnie Youngblood said on May 23rd, 2013, three years ago this month, that David Silva, quote, died from heart disease, unquote. That was said with a straight face. Their story was that he died of natural causes. That's what they said. While he was being beaten with batons, bitten in the face by a police dog, hog-tied, 
compressed chest down with multiple deputies on his back. Supposedly, he spontaneously died of natural causes. That was the official story, which was accepted by the district attorney's office. In this case, we retained uh, the former medical examiner for Ventura County to give his opinion. He was able to determine that David Silva died as a result of being asphyxiated. He was asphyxiated because he was hogtied chest down with multiple deputies on his back for as long as 10 minutes. Youngblood also told reporters three years ago this month that the conduct of all the deputies was investigated and found to be, quote, within department policy, unquote. We took the depositions of top brass in the sheriff's department who testified under oath when I asked them that, in fact, the Sheriff's Department made no factual findings as a result of its investigation and made no determination about whether the conduct of the deputies was within or not within policy. And those are just a couple of examples of the many ways that the official story of David Silva's death turned out not to be true. So the next time you're at a press conference with the sheriff or somebody from the sheriff's department and they say well this person died and this is how it happened remember this case remember David Silva because the official story in this case turned out not to be true for the past three years the Silva family has been fighting against this cover-up you may have seen Mary Silva or Chris Silva out on the street corner with a sign that says justice for David Silva and I'm sure that there were times when it seemed to them like it was their voices against the world their voices against an entire system but the Silva family never gave up they insisted on telling the truth about what happened and it's thanks to their courage and perseverance that we're all here today I'm proud to have represented this family I'm proud to have been part of this important case and I'm proud of this victory for civil rights, not just for the Silva family, but for all victims of police brutality. Thanks. My name is David Cohn, obviously one of the attorneys involved in this case, and I wanted to make a few comments uh, regarding uh, statements made by Sheriff Youngblood regarding this case. Sheriff Youngblood has said that uh, his department didn't do anything wrong. And in fact, what he points to is uh, the coroner's investigation, and specifically what he points to is the uh, examination by the pathologist who performed the autopsy on David. And what Sheriff Youngblood said is that uh, there was no foul play, and as Tom Sebaugh just said, uh, everything that was done was done within department guidelines. Well, again, we had an opportunity to take the deposition of the pathologist, the doctor that did the autopsy. And what the pathologist was told was that there was no foul play. That was all of the information that the pathologist was ever provided by either the sheriff's department or the coroner's investigation. Now, we know, of course, that the facts are quite different than that. Was the pathologist ever told that David was on his stomach for almost 10 minutes and that officers were on top of him uh, at the time that they were apparently attempting to make an arrest. The coroner was never given that information. Was the coroner told that David was hogtied with officers on his back? The coroner was never given that information. Was the coroner told that David was being attacked by the sheriff's uh, canine? Uh, during this whole period. The coroner was never given that information. 
all of the information, and it wasn't very much information, that was given to the pathologist was supplied by the coroner's investigation and the sheriff's department. And of course, what do we know about the relationship between the sheriff's department and the coroner? They're one and the same. The sheriff is the coroner in this county. So how can you have an effective investigation? How can you have an unbiased investigation when the coroner is an arm of the sheriff's department? So when Sheriff Youngblood says that there was no foul play and he bases his comments on the coroner's report and the autopsy performed by the pathologist, ask yourselves, a, was that a thorough investigation? And B, was that uh, an unvarnished and completely objective investigation? I think you have to conclude that if the county is willing to pay these victims $3.4 million, it's very clear that there was wrongdoing on the part of the county. You know, I've seen comments made by some people uh, in the community regarding this settlement. And some of the people appear to be angry and upset that these victims uh, have received this type of settlement. The citizens of this county ought to direct their anger toward the Sheriff's Department. The majority of this settlement is paid for by the taxpayers. We all know that this is not the first instance where this sheriff's department has been found to have done things that are not within department guidelines, that they have been responsible for the untimely deaths of other victims. So. I think the community needs to ask itself, when is this going to stop? When have we as a community, when are we as a community going to demand some change within the Sheriff's Department? When is the culture of the Sheriff's Department going to change so that we're not conducting further press conferences. We're not going to have victims uh, of the conduct of the Sheriff's Department when they acted outside of not only department guidelines, but guidelines that are established across all law enforcement. So again, I don't want to sit here in front of you uh, with another family. So let's try to change the culture within that department, and it should start with this case. Now, I guess we'll, we'll let Chris, Chris, why don't you? Hey, Lou, I'm uh, Chris Silva, uh, David's brother. Um, I just want to thank the lawyers, without lawyers, these elite lawyers, um, for three years, almost exactly three years, these lawyers have been fighting hard, and I've been, you know, very beginning, I was on TV crying by myself, and these lawyers, it's been night and day, really trying to get justice for my brother, um, and I have to thank them for that, because if it wasn't for these lawyers, we'd just be holding a sign on the corner while you guys are just driving by. So it's just the power of these lawyers, it's pretty amazing. And I, I can't be, my mom and I, are, my family and I are very grateful for it. Um, from the very beginning, we told you how David died. And uh, we've been telling you every day, as much as we can, uh, this $3.4 million should say something. Yet, the sheriff of this town is still in denial. And that's the saddest part, because we know what follows. We know more people will be victimized by this law type of law enforcement. You know, I, I wish I could say to the public, please wake up and please join us in this fight, but 
I don't think people are waking up yet and people are seem to be okay with this type of behavior. And nine officers on a man that was on the ground that couldn't get up. My brother was committing no crime. My brother was looking for help. And the best they can do is beat him down, attack, send an attack dog on him twice, um, beat him with batons, you know, sucker punch him, slam him on the ground while he's in the hog tie position, suffocate him basically, and the public does nothing. The public does nothing. The, the, the sheriff does nothing. The district attorney says she did an investigation. And I was in that live press conference room. She said she concluded it. And she did, they did no real investigation. The FBI did no investigation. They reviewed the sheriff's report. These lawyers didn't do a review. They did a thorough investigation. So I asked everyone that's in this position that we're in, people that are victims or surviving, you're going to raise, you're gonna raise some hell in this town before anyone wakes up. You know, hopefully this is an eye opener. You know, I think people are still in denial, but a man on the ground for 20 minutes getting killed should wake some people up. And I just want to thank everyone that supported us, all the media that came out and really told the truth. This wasn't accidental. This is far from accidental. And uh, hopefully somebody really wakes up and really reviews this information. This information is amazing. And if you sat with this like we did, like the lawyers did, you'd be confident in knowing that. The sheriff is not quali qualified to be a sheriff. The district attorney is not qualified to be a district attorney. And hopefully everyone really looks into this. And I, like I've been saying that for how long? For three years. And yet I bet no one is even caring. But uh, if anyone needs help, you know, come join us. You know, if anyone gets victimized, please join us. We'll rally. We'll rally for you. But this has to stop. Thank you. Chris, I wanted to ask you, are you going to be doing more? And you kind of said that, but... Yeah, I mean, for the civil settlement, we knew, I've told you before, this is this, this is the civil, you know, this is a very specific case, situation. My focus now is the nine officers. We've been very polite about those officers. Uh, their histories need to be exposed. Their behaviors within this case need to be exposed. So after this right now, um, they need to be known. You know, these officers are walking around uncaring. You know, they, they, they've got nothing. They've, they've got a paid vacation for a week or two. That's the most they got out of this. Um, but people need to know the, their behavior with that night. And nobody knows really because we had to be quiet. I've had to be quiet. Even talking to you in the interviews I've had with you, I've had to restrain myself because I knew a civil trial was in, in, underway. Now I can talk. And you'll see more of that in the future. Hi, my name is Mary Silva, and I am, first I want to wish everybody a happy Mother's Day. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. I'm going to be minus one son. Remember that. I remember every month that the last of May. Enjoy it. I have one son here, and man, he's pulled the load. No, nobody else could do what he did. Nobody. I have seen nobody do as much work as he has done. You know what? We stood out, we cried, we begged. We begged. David did nothing wrong trying to get help that night. The first three responding officers, you've got Kelly, Almanzo, and Swords. They're the three big heavy hitters. I sat in on the deposition, let me make it very clear. All of them said that David never stood up, punched him, kicked him, spit on him, or used foul language. My children, I love them to pieces, and I do this again. I want this to happen again. And we support all the other families that are going through the same thing, and we'll do it again. It's not over. You heard what Chris said. It's not over. It's not. It's a peaceful way of settling. I have grandchildren, and I don't want to go have them go through court seeing what they're going to do to their daddy. I've seen it. They, they've been exposed to enough. I'm looking out for their interests and making sure that they have a light at the end of the tunnel. And I want to say thank you to Mr. David Cohen, Tom Sebaugh, Neil Gillawatt, Dale Gallipo, and all the people that have supported us. Hopefully, you guys are going to be doing something that will make a difference. It's in your hands. 
Mary, a little bit ago, I, someone said you were like a voice against the system, and I saw you nod your head. Can you expand on that? No, I think you uh, clarified it. Thank you. Um, any questions for the lawyers or for Chris or for Mary? I do. Um, you talk about doing the depositions. What more, and you found out more, what more did you find out in the depositions that you took? Well, we, um, we took the depositions of all of the deputies and the officers uh, who were involved in this incident. And some of the things that we learned from those depositions was that uh, David was unarmed, he was asleep, he never punched an officer, he never kicked an officer, he never made a verbal threat to an officer. And yet, despite being asleep, these officers hit him with batons, they put a canine on him, they put him in a prone position, they put pressure on his back for an extended period of time, they put a spit mask on his face, when he vomited in the spit mask, they refused to take the spit mask off, knowing well that people can die when they choke on their own vomit. They applied pressure to his back for at least five minutes, if not more. And he died. Are there new things that you've heard that you think are, that we should know about? Things that we hadn't heard in the other, um, like the pathologist report and so forth, when you took the depositions, what more did you hear that we didn't know before? I think that there are really uh, two or three things, and I'll, I'll let Tom talk about this too, uh, that I think are really shocking to us. Um, one is the cover-up. Um, witnesses testified that they took video of this incident, and after they took video of the incident on their cell phone, they watched the incident on their cell phone. They watched the video that they took and that the officers took their cell phones away and in the case of one witness at least told that witness that they were going to delete the video. And when he got his cell phone back there was no video. And the judge in our case had made a ruling based on what the witness had testified to in his deposition that he was going to give the jury an instruction that the defense willfully destroyed the evidence in this case. And so they were going to have to come up and explain why all of this happened. That's one issue. The second issue I thought that was very surprising to us was one that Tom talked about. They came out and said, we did nothing wrong. Our officers all acted within policy. But then when we took the deposition of the person most knowledgeable at the Sheriff's Department and we said, did you make a determination as to whether or not Sergeant Sword's actions were within policy? No. We didn't make a decision one way or the other. We didn't make a decision with respect to whether or not any of these officers' actions were within policy. Really what it was was a tactical, legal decision that they made because they didn't want to come forward and say that they were within policy or that they were not within policy. And then the last thing I would say is the misinformation given to the coroner, which David talked about. Well, it wasn't even misinformation. It was no information. Right. I mean, it was so scant on, when we took the pathologist's deposition. He wasn't given any, he re really was not given any information. Uh, he was simply told uh, there was there was a struggle. It was all on David's fault. Uh, they actually looked for uh, medical reasons to use medical uh, a medical basis uh, as the basis for David's death, and never supplied the pathologist with any of this vital information that absolutely contributed and caused David's death. I mean, to not, for instance, tell the pathologist that a number of people were on top of his back for, as Neil said, uh, as long as five minutes. Never given that information. Never told that the spit mask was applied, which of course, as you can imagine, makes it more difficult for one to breathe. We're never told that the CHP 
supply hobbles, which uh, are devices that are attached to his legs. So when David was on his back, uh, on his stomach, he was essentially hogtied because they put the devices, the device on his legs, and then David was handcuffed in the back, and they pulled his legs up and attached the hobble uh, to the handcuffs. So imagine you're in a situation where David's on his stomach, he's hogtied, officers are on top of him, he's being hit with batons, the spit mask is on him, wouldn't you think that that would be information that the coroner would supply to the pathologist, the man that is going to rule on the cause of death? And, and Carol, we're, we're happy, uh, and Chris has these copies too, we're happy to provide people with these deposition transcripts so you can see these kinds of things. Other questions? Can you tell us how much is coming from, of the money, how much is coming from the county's insurance, how much from the county itself, what, what the breakdown is with that? Um, well, approximately. It's, it's a pro so the county has uh, what's called a self-insured retention. What that means is that $2,500,000 comes out of the county budget comes out of the sheriff's budget in this instance toward defending this case. Now, of that $2.5 million, some of that money is used to pay for the lawyers that represented officers, sword, um, yeah. and, and the other two. In some, basically, the there was about $600,000 of the 2.5 that was paid to representing the officers uh, in this case, as far as the defense goes. So there was about a million nine, one million nine hundred thousand dollars that was left of the county money that contributed to this settlement. And then there was money that came from excess insurance carriers, um, and then some money that came from the highway patrol. Small amount from the highway patrol. There were highway patrolmen there, so was this claim against the state, and did the state pay some of this? So what happens is uh, when the case is in federal court, uh, because of sovereign immunity, if you sue the state, you have to sue them in state court. You cannot sue them in federal court. So what we did is we sued the individual highway patrol officers in their individual capacities, and the government code then has a section that provides that uh, any monies owed or paid by the officers in their individual capacities to the plaintiffs in this case, uh, they have to be indemnified by the state. So the state ultimately is paying money on behalf of the two officers who were involved in the altercation. We don't know the exact number, uh, but it is a small amount uh, relative to the amount paid by uh, the county and its excess carrier. So the county's paying the 3.4 million. The county and the CHP together are paying 3.4 million. Of that 3.4, how much came from the CHP, we don't quite know yet, but that's encompassed within the 3.4. Okay. You mentioned that there should be more about the officers revealed. Is there anything you can tell us at this time? Well, I think that was something that, that uh, Chris and, and Mary talked about, and I'm happy to let them answer it if you want. Chris? Yeah, this is the dash cam, turning off the dash cam. You know, that's an interesting situation. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Sure. Uh, there was testimony given by the highway patrol officers that before the altercation was over, uh, they went back to their vehicles and turned off their dash cam videos, uh, which are on the front of... Uh, their vehicles before the altercation was over, um, and uh, that would be one thing, for example, that, that was out there. We can, we can provide the original documents. There's another, uh, the sergeant changed his story dramatically from his initial interview because he said he had a dream. It's hard to make this stuff up. This is truth, not fiction. He said he had a dream, and as a result of his dream, he remembered that the incident actually took place a completely different way. A sergeant with a sheriff's That was Sergeant Sword. Sword. Okay. 
And what he, yeah, what he had said about the dream in particular uh, was that uh, he had a dream several days later where he remembered that there was a baton lying on the ground and David was reaching for the baton and that he then conferred with Deputy Kelly about that and they said, oh yeah, that's true. And then, in addition to that, the investigator from the Sheriff's Department in the report said, it's common in my experience as an investigator that officers oftentimes have dreams where they're able to remember things and then it turns out that those things can be accurate even though none of the other officers saw a baton on the ground, even though we believe that the reality is that there was never a baton lying on the ground and David was never reaching for it. David was originally turned away from the Mary Kay Shell Center. Right. Does this lawsuit include anything in that, or is there going to be any action towards that? No. no. The, uh, they, they, what they told uh, David that night was that there were not enough beds to, to care for him. Um, and that's why he was sent away. One more thing that I think is also very important is that after David was turned away, he went and he fell asleep in an area next to Kern Medical Center. And when he was asleep, he was woken up by security guards with TransWest, and they were able to wake him up without using any force. And they were able to say, sir, you can't sleep here and they walked him off the property so that he could walk across the street and that's when he fell asleep. So how is it that private security guards faced with almost the same situation are able to wake this man up, talk to him, have no problem with him, and walk him across the street? And yet, when faced with the same situation, these sheriff's deputies and officers killed David. No. The sheriff's office has said Mr. Silva was intoxicated at the time. He's a large gentleman that they needed the, uh, the amount of people that they had to, for lack of a better term, secure him. What was the, your response to that? You want to take it? Well, at a certain point, they had him chest down, handcuffed, his legs hobbled with two hobbles, and then the hobbles connected with the handcuffs. Now, deputies and officers are trained in that situation. Once you have the person in that configuration, you're supposed to immediately turn them onto their side so that they don't asphyxiate. Is that, <coughs> so what was happening was, David was, and the officers testified to this, he was trying to lift himself up. He kept lot, trying to lift his chest up. And they said, well, when he did that, we pushed back down. And then he tried to lift his chest up, and we pushed it down. And our response is, there was absolutely no reason to push his chest down at that point. That was asphyxiating him. What they should have done is turn him onto his side. If they had done that, he would have probably lived. Well, and, and more than that, look at the situation. He's hobbled. Where was he going to go? What was he going to do? If 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 the deputies had simply backed off, stood up, walked away from him, what was he going to do? He was completely restrained. And let's not mince words about the numbers here, right? You have one man and you have nine officers. And a dog. Will you be seeking uh, criminal charges against these officers and uh, commanding officers? Well, it, I, Remember earlier, Lisa Green, our district attorney, said that her department had conducted a review of the situation. They didn't find any wrongdoing on the part of the sheriff's department, so she saw no basis uh, in which to prosecute any of the officers. So, it, it, it's unfortunately, it, it's not up to us as private citizens to be able to, you know, ask, we, we can ask the criminal charges be levied against these officers, but it's clear three years down the line with these officers back on the street that there aren't going to be any criminal charges levied against them. If, if they had done a thorough investigation as, a, as opposed to this review, 
I think the circumstance might have been different, although you have to, again, you've got a situation where you have a district attorney that works intimately with the sheriff's department. It's rife with conflict. Uh, we, yeah, we do not, and I'll defer to you in a second, we don't have the ability to bring criminal charges ourselves. That would be uh, the decision up to the DA or the Attorney General's office or the Department of Justice. But uh, we would invite the Department of Justice to come in and do an investigation of the Sheriff's Department uh, because of the number of killings that have occurred over the last five years within that department. That maybe someone needs, needs to take a hard look at the training that's given to them and the lack of discipline that's imposed upon them after these kinds of things. Well, there's two points that I'd like to make about that. One is, as a statistical matter, Bakersfield has the highest rates per capita of <coughs> deaths at the hands of the police than any, more than any other city in the country. Higher than Chicago, higher than New York. Bakersfield is number one. And so that is something that needs to be talked about. Also, and I think the point about criminal prosecution highlights a much bigger problem, which is that every day in the United States, there are verdicts, civil rights verdicts against police officers, there are settlements involving police officers, and civil rights claims. But I, it must be true that in 99.99% .99 of those cases, the officer was never criminally prosecuted and was also never disciplined or there are never any adverse internal personnel consequences in the department. And that's a major contradiction. Every day, juries are finding that, civil, that police officers are violating civil rights, but the prosecutors are doing nothing, and the uh, departments themselves are doing nothing internally. And that's something that also needs to be talked about. Any other questions? OK. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you for your time.